Hello, my name is Corey Barnett. I am a PA student at the University of Mount Union and I did my master's capstone project on the MAKO system looking to see if it lowers complications and or if it improves post-surgical results in uh, patients undergoing a total knee arthroplasty in the setting of end-stage knee osteoarthritis. This is just a table of contents uh, for convenience for potential referencing throughout the, the presentation. So to kind of get our minds rolling a little bit, uh, I have a clinical vignette with the patient um, having a chief complaint of my right knee is bothering me again. Um, the patient is a 71 year old African American female that has been having knee pain for the last 15 years. When it initially started, she went to her PCP to uh, kind of get it checked out and her PCP um, told her she had early stages of knee osteoarthritis and told her to start modifying her, her lifestyle, um, which she did and she kind of, the pain kind of started to, to diminish and then began to flare up again five years later. She went back to her PCP and was told to try conservative treatment uh, with NSAIDs, ice, heat, and a knee brace. So as the time passed, the pain continued to get worse um, and she visited her local P local orthopedic office uh, four months ago, where the PA felt it was, it was time and it was necessary to do a corticosteroid injection to the right knee. The injection was fairly beneficial for the last three months, um, but until about a week ago, she was experiencing some severe pain again. Um, she rates the pain today as an 8 out of 10, uh, and describes it as dull and achy on the medial aspect of her right knee, uh, without any radiation, numbness, or tingling, anything like that. But she also is starting to um, admit and notice the crackling and popping sounds and feeling and also some swelling around her knee, the crepitation and edema that is associated with the knee osteoarthritis. Um, since she has tried the uh, NSAIDs and ice and heat and rest, the conservative treatments, um, we will discuss some, some possible further uh, treatment options for her later on. So during um, the interview with the patient, um, there is review of systems asked and a lot of them were pretty negative and not important in this um, setting, but some of the questions asked um, were if she had any weight loss, any loss of, loss of appetite, any recent fever, chills, signs of infection, things like that. Um, any changes in her skin, any head trauma, changes in vision, etc. Um, and if there is any neck stiffness, any uh, respiratory symptoms or cardiovascular symptoms, um, and everything that uh, was asked turned out to be negative for our patient in G today. So a continuation of the review of systems, as you can see, I highlighted the pertinent information um, in red just to kind of draw your attention to where she admitted to, to some pertinent positives. Um, like I said on the last slide, most of the things um, are negative, so I'm going to spend more time on the musculoskeletal system. Um, when asked, the patient admit, admitted to dull, achy pain in the right knee for the past 15 years. Um, but more importantly, with a recent exacerbation of her symptoms. She, al she also admitted to uh, the crepitation, that cracking, popping uh, sensation and feeling um, while she was walking around. And she also had some um, generalized edema in the right knee. But as I said before, denies any weakness or numbness in uh, that extremity along with any of the other extremities. So her past medical history is significant for osteoarthritis, which we kind of have an idea of osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. Um, she is on some medications for these conditions, amlodipine for the hypertension, metformin for the type 2 diabetes, um, <clears throat> vitamin D for the um, osteoporosis, and then Tylenol as needed for the uh, breakthrough pain for the osteoarthritis. Um, and her allergies um, were insignificant as she denies any allergies to food, medications, or latex. So getting an idea of the family history and social history for a patient is also pretty significant to, to see if anything else might be contributing to this. 
Um, her family history is pretty benign with her mother having similar diseases or di conditions as her hypertension, osteoarthritis in the left hip, and then type 2 diabetes. Her father didn't have any significant past medical history, but her brother has um, significant uh, history for hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, there is no family history of any cancer. Uh, socially, she worked as a high school high school biology teacher and consumes about two to three alcoholic beverages per week socially and denies any tobacco or illicit drug use. So her physical exam was pretty benign uh, but it is important to kind of look at other symptoms in case there is something going on. Her vital signs were within normal limits. Uh, she's a febrile, appears appropriate for her age, acting appropriate, all those good things. Regular rate and rhythm and no uh, dyspnea or wheezing on exam for her um, pulmonary and cardiovascular assessment. I will draw attention to more so the musculoskeletal system. Um, so again, I kind of highlighted the musculoskeletal system and the pertinent positives in red just to kind of draw your attention to those things. So upon palpation to the right knee, um, there was some, some generalized tenderness there with um, some mild edema noted. There is moderate crepitus on a passive range of motion as well, but she had normal um, strength, normal range of motion, and sensation in her lower extremities bilaterally. And the, for special tests, there were no um, limb laxities um, that were elicited, so negative anterior posterior drawer tests along with McMurray's. So in the setting of um, orthopedics, it is very important to kind of get an idea or an image of uh, what is going on. So for her, we got a um, an x-ray, a plain radio radiography of um, the right knee. And this, as depicted, kind of shows some, some large osteophytes, um, basically just bone spurs, and significant joint space narrowing, as you can see on the medial aspect of her uh, right knee. And there was also some severe bone sclerosis um, noted in the image as well. And later on in this uh, presentation, I will kind of depict and um, describe a little bit more about the staging of knee osteoarthritis with the use of x-ray. So the assessment and plan for NG, obviously we know from our physical exam and radiographic images that she has severe osteoarthritis of the right knee, but it is important to kind of correlate um, every option or treatment option available for her. So we discussed the continuation of conservative treatment options such as corticosteroid injections every three months while monitoring her uh, sugar levels because she is a type 2 diabetic and that is a side effect of um, corticosteroids. Um, it, which increases the, the blood sugar levels. Uh, we also discussed surgical options of manual total knee arthroplasties versus robotic assisted uh, total knee arthroplasties, um, both weighing the benefits and risks um, of those procedures. With this being a um, research presentation on the MAKO system lowering possible complications, she obviously went with the um, choice for the robotic assisted TKA and so a preoperative CT scan was ordered for the patient in order to kind of get started and get rolling with the procedure. So with NG um, it, it, accepting and agreeing to undergoing a robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty that brings me to my research question. Um, in my research question stated, does using the MAKO system, um, which is a robotic assisted tool in a total knee arthroplasty, lower complications and or improve post-surgical results compared to um, undergoing a conventional total knee arthroplasty procedure um, for patients um, with end-stage knee osteoarthritis such as NG has? So getting to a little bit of background information for knee osteoarthritis, um, 
it's a degeneration of the knee joint and pretty much all that is composed within it and we will kind of discuss um, what makes up the knee joint uh, a little further into this presentation. So it is commonly known as the wear and tear disease and thought to be related uh, to the aging process, which it is, but not all of the factors uh, kind of correlate with just aging. There are other factors that um, play an important role in the development of knee osteoarthritis, and we will also discuss that later in um, this presentation as well. So for that reason, it's also ca called uh, degenerative joint disease, and you can kind of see from the picture, um, and you can kind of see from the picture why it's called that. You have a normal knee with the articular uh, hyaline cartilage intact, normal joint spaces, um, and then if you look over to the right, you see in a knee that has significant osteoarthritis um, with deterioration of the cartilage, um, joint space narrowing, some, some osteophytes or bone spurs. So to get a better idea of knee osteoarthritis, we want to get a good idea of the um, anatomical layout of it, of the knee. So it is primarily composed of three bones, the distal femur, proximal tibia, and also the patella. Um, it is referred to as a hinge joint, allowing it to flex and extend rather than twist side to side. Um, there is some motion side to side, but it's mostly flex and extend, such as the elbow. Um, the knee is composed of articular hyaline cartilage and its four main components, which are type 2 collagen, proteoglycans, chondrocytes, and water. Um, and for the pathophys pathophysiology of knee osteoarthritis, there is a disruption of um, the four main components of articular cartilage and the matrix, matrix metalloproteases, or MMPs. Um, in, in, in order to the joint to perform daily activities without complications, the equilibrium between these must remain stable. If the MMPs become overexpressed, disrupting equilibrium and homeostasis, there's a loss of collagen and proteoglycans, which in turn causes the chondrocytes to uh, secrete um, tissue inhibitors of MMPs in an attempt to increase the synthesis of proteoglycans to regain equilibrium. If this is unsuccessful, um, the water in the joint increases and the collagen become disorganized and there is a loss of articular cartilage leading to the degeneration. Uh, these microscopic changes um, can lead to detrimental and debilitating pain as described before uh, for patients. So looking at uh, what causes knee osteoarthritis now that we kind of have a good idea of the uh, anatomical layout and what composes the uh, knee. This is a multifactorial complex of interplay of constitutional and mechanical factors, um, including joint integrity, genetic predisposition, local inflammation, mechanical factors, and cellular and biomechanical processes. It can be broken down into primary and secondary etiologies. Uh, primary being most commonly referred to as idiopathic, meaning we don't have really an idea as to why this is happening or why this stuff is being degenerated. Um, the secondary forms encompasses more of a larger variety of potential causes, <clears throat> trauma being the most common. Um, trauma to the distal um, femur, proximal tibia, and the patella can also um, be, be attributed to this, and it is. Um, can, and like I said, congenital or developmental disorders um, is, is also a, a factor that can play a role in the development of knee osteoarthritis. And we'll get into some more conversation about the secondary etiologies, the risk factors, um, <clears throat> but there is not one specific cause to uh, knee osteoarthritis. Like I said, it is multifactorial as most of these patients have multiple things going on leading to um, the disruption of homeostasis of the articular uh, cartilage. So now that we have a more realistic approach and more um, better understanding of the knee itself, um, the risk factors for knee osteoarthritis can be broken down into non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. Um, age is the most notable risk factor um, 
most notable non-modifiable risk factor as radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis occurs in individuals over the age of 65. And interestingly enough, over 75% of people older than 75 of 75 years of age have significant problems with uh, knee osteoarthritis. Um, also, sex and ethnicity, as in African American females over the age of 50, have a, um, a, a great chance of developing uh, knee osteoarthritis. And as mentioned, genetic predisposition plays a role, but not as significant as the age. So moving on to the modifiable risk factors uh, for knee osteoarthritis. Obesity is by far the, the leading factor in this. Um, most notable uh, as increase in body, body mass index increases joint loading, leading to detrimental effects on the cartilage in that homeostasis that we talked about before. Also with obesity comes the elevated blood glucose and C-reactive protein levels, leading to um, disruption in the homeostasis and also to inflammation. Excessive kneeling, bending, squatting, standing, and carrying heavy loads also plays role in this. Also similar to um, obesity, it increases that weight on the joint leading to detrimental effects. Similarly with high intensity and high uh, impact events, uh, trauma as we talked about before is a cause of this and also um, that increases forces to the joint and pot potential injuries. Interestingly enough, that exercising, exercising um, just recreationally, like running and lifting, did not increase the risk of uh, knee osteoarthritis. And then acute injuries leading to, um, to fractures and stress on the knee also in, is a risk factor for um, knee osteoarthritis. So the presentation of knee osteoarthritis is kind of dependent on where the patient is uh, in their development of knee osteoarthritis. Some patients will have extreme debilitating pain that limits their day-to-day -day activities. Others may have little to no symptoms, and depending on this stage and where you classify it at, it will kind of lead to um, how you treat the patient. Um, according to Mahir et al., the most common symptom um, of knee osteoarthritis is pain around the affected knee joint. Um, it can, like I said before, it can be mild to severe pain described as dull, achy, um, and it's usually with initiation of movement, so like getting up in the morning or after sitting for long, per long periods. Um, as it progresses, the patients will complain of carpitation or like that catching, clicking, popping, um, grinding sensation and feeling and um, noise that they can hear, and this can be elicited on... Um, thorough history or even with physical exam by placing your hand on the knee and then having them move it and you being able to feel that crepitation. Once it progresses into more severe or moderate stages, swelling, locking, and feeling of the knee giving out is um, where is what these patients will typically present with. Um, once, they pay, once the patient starts to feel continuous pain, then it's typically uh, time to seek medical conditions such as the um, it, such as NG did. So diagnosing and classifying knee osteoarthritis um, is very important because it will determine your uh, treatment options as well. So as discussed before, getting a thorough history of the chronic health conditions, history of trauma, injury, and those potential um, risk factors and causes is, is something very beneficial to the, to the provider. Getting a thorough physical exam is also crucial. Um, you would want to do this bilaterally on both knees to determine what's normal and what's not normal, have something to compare it with. Um, you want to inspect, look for any edema, infection, see if there's anything else going on, feel it, feel the knee to see if there's any tenderness, effusion, um, things like that. Move the knee around, um, active passive range of motion, feel that crepitation, see if there's any catching, clicking, popping uh, sensation going on. Strength testing is very important to see if there's any neurological uh, disorders going on that might lead you to a different direction or solidify you in another direction. Um, you would want to see the patient walk, whether that's in the room or before they even get into the room. Just take note if they're compensating, uh, if they're using a walker or assistive device to kind of get around as well. Special tests during the exam, you know, um, looking at lig ligaments, see if they're lax, see if there is uh, instability there, the McMurray's anterior posterior drawer test, the Lachman's test are very important. 
Um, and then according to Lespacio et al., not one single clinical feature is 100% specific or sensitive to making the diagnosis. So looking at um, radiographic evidence might be beneficial. But of course, the American College of Rheumatology suggests that the diagnosis can be made clinically without um, x-rays. But if you are getting x-rays, um, they can be used to assess the joint and rule out other possible etiologies of pain. And then they also provide a good source to kind of base, um, kind of get a, a uh, idea as to the severity of it using the Kellen Green and Lawrence scale, which I'll uh, be describing here soon. So once you get a x-ray to kind of see how the knee is looking, you'll be able to use the Kellen Green and Lawrence scale to kind of determine um, where they are in severity wise and help you progress with uh, the necessary treatment. So the first picture over here, the arrow kind of indicates some joint space narrowing, um, some osteophytic uh, li uh, lipping as well, uh, but it, it's very mild. The next picture over, you have some more um, joint space narrowing that's becoming more evident, some um, osteophytes or bone spurs starting to form on that medial side as well. And then the um, next, next picture with the two arrows, um, is more of a moderate to severe uh, category with the arrows indicating multiple osteophytes or bone spurs, some definitive joint space narrowing on that medial side, um, some, some sclerosis, and also bony deformity as it looks like there could be like a, a, a varus deformity going on there. Um, then the final picture is showing very large osteophytes, bone on bone action, basically no joint space whatsoever. Um, and then some severe bone sclerosis and de definitive obvious bone deformity uh, in the medial tibial plateau. So this would be classified more so as the, the severe um, category needing uh, operation or a TKA. So in terms of conservative treatment, um, all treatment is really directed toward the goal of relieving the patient's pain, improving the function, and limiting the patient's disabilities. Um, treatment is driven by the severity of symptoms, maybe even using the Kellen Green and Lawrence scale, and overall potential uh, to improve the quality of life for the patient. It can either be a, a one-type treatment, maybe just using ice or occasional NSAIDs, or it could be multidisciplinary approach with the patient. Um, depending on their symptoms and severity. Um, identifying the aggravating triggers and modifying the lifestyles will help uh, initiate some of this treatment, maybe eliminating the, the uh, strenuous and high intensity um, activity on the joint, heating and icing, it, vasodilating and vasoconstricting those blood vessels to help soothe and reduce, or soothe the muscles and reduce some of the, the edema. Using a TENS unit, um, can provide some nerve stimulation to therefore provide pain relief in some patients as well. Assistive devices such as canes, walkers, um, shoe inserts, knee braces, things like that can also provide stability, pain relief um, by shifting some of their uh, weight off of that affected joint and putting it on the, the assistive device. Then again, medications, the typical um, class for this is would be your NSAIDs, um, you know, like the... Um, Silicoxib or um, uh, like the Tylenol type type medications are very uh, beneficial in these uh, patients. And then moving on to intraarticular injections and uh, corticosteroid injections, be careful of the adverse effects there. The um, the synovial fluid injections, trying to provide some cushion for the bone uh, for the joint space narrowing aspect of it. So moving on to surgical treatments, uh, once the pain becomes unbearable or the patient receives a, a grade 4 on the Kellen Green and Lawrence scale where um, all conservative treatments that we just discussed were, have been attempted and failed, um, surgery becomes, becomes really necessarily necessary and, and inevitable. Um, one of the most common and uh, cost-effective and overall successful surgeries performed in orthopedics today is a total knee arthroplasty. Um, on a whole, patients really report improvement of pain, function, and quality of life, which, as I stated before, is the goal of, of our treatment. Um, 
So it typically takes the surgeon about one to two hours um, to remove the damaged cartilage and, and once that it's cleared and aligned, a metal jig is used throughout to plan incisions and placement of the devices. Um, all of this is uh, manual labor. Um, it can be cumbersome and leading to more complications for the patients um, and some uh, increased effort for the, the surgeons. And thankfully, as um, there have been technological advancements um, in everyday life, this is the same for, for surgery, um, which we have been able to use the technological advancements and create some, some advancements in, in surgery. So as I said, um, surgery can be kind of demanding on the surgery and uh, on the surgeon and um, in the pursuit of trying to improve clinical outcomes postoperatively, medicine has started to turn to technology for more assistance. Um, over the last two decades, you know, um, computer navigated and robotic assistive surgeries have started to be, started to be introduced. Um, there are three distinct uh, types of computer assisted surgical systems in practice. All of them are relatively similar in that a computer kind of integrates information from landmarks on images to determine the frontal and sagittal plane uh, to properly position uh, the cutting guides. Um, <clears throat> so robotics were introduced with the aim of improving prosthesis alignment and to reduce rates of complications associated with surgeries. There is preoperative planning and intraoperative dynamic referencing um, <clears throat> in terms of allowing that feedback within the surgeon. Um, it allows for real-time uh, intraoperative dynamic referencing uh, to allow for con continuous assessment of range of motion and to allow for um, determination of stress on the ligaments. <clears throat> No, um, and then like the MAGO system is really at the forefront of that, um, and this allows patients to undergo a preoperative CT scan, which creates a 3D model that allows the surgeons to kind of template where um, these specific landmarks are and um, how he wants to create the uh, cutting guides to, to create the best possible outcome for the patient. So this kind of gets uh, into the methods of my research. It was a system, systematic review of literature. Um, the research question was uh, formulated using the PICO, uh, PICO uh, model. Um, and the P stands for pa uh, population. And my population was patients in need of a total knee arthroplasty due to the symptoms of knee osteoarthritis. I stands for intervention. I'm using the MAKO robotic arm uh, interactive system. C is comparison. I'm comparing it with the manual uh, total knee arthroplasty, and the O is outcome, um, hoping to see if this lowers outcomes and improved um, outcomes for post-operative patients. I used PubMed, Pud, PubMed Google Scholar, and EBSCOhost um, using uh, key search terms such as robotic knee surgery, total knee arthroplasty, uh, robotic assisted. Um, clinical outcomes and complications, and may go. So my inclusion and exclusion criteria um, were outcomes of robotic-assisted TKA versus manual TKA, patients 18 and older who received a primary TKA, and patients um, reporting outcomes using validated scales and radiographic outcomes. My exclusion criteria kind of included um, case reports and surgical um, techniques, review articles, and experts' opinions, instructional course uh, lectures, and studies on animals and or cadavers. So this is just a chart that I created to help um, better collect all the, the information that I am about to present. I will dive into each study um, in detail, uh, but this is just for your uh, convenience. So the first study that we're going to look at is Mitchell et al. This was a retrospective review of all robotic-assisted or manual TKA procedures performed at one surgery center between April 20, 2015 and September 2017. So there is a total of 287 uh, surgeries, 139 being manual and 148 being robotic. Um, 
uh, all the TKAs were performed by the same surgeon at the same center, so there was good consistency there. Prior to October 2016, all the procedures done were um, done using a conventional method or that uh, manual TKA. Um, October 16th and on, all TK TKAs were performed with uh, the MAKO system. The assessments included in this study were preoperative and one-year follow-up uh, patient-reported outcome measures or PROMs, uh, tourniquet, tourniquet time, intraoperative and postoperative complications, and 30 and 90-day readmission rates and discharge disposition. Significance was defined as P of 0 0.05. So looking at the two cohorts, uh, for the manual TKA, there is two intraoperative uh, tibia, tibia fractures along with uh, deep surgical site infections and none reported in the robotic-assisted TKA group. Uh, the mean tourniquet time did reach significance um, favoring the manual TKA um, at 91.6 minutes versus the robotic-assisted TKA at 96.8. Um, <clears throat> Then that did come down um, as the surgeon became more familiar with the robotic assisted TKA. In the last 20 um, cases done, there was no significance um, in that. The length of stay for the patients and the manual TKA was 1.73 days, while the um, length of stay for the robotic assisted was 1.18, reaching a significance of p value of less than 0 0.001. There are 13. 0.3 PT visits uh, for the manual TKA group versus 11 um, for the um, robotic assisted TKA group, so that was was significant as well. Um, readmission rates were higher um, for the manual TKA due to um, increased international normalized ratio, a DVT, PE, um, acute congestive heart failure, and acute renal failure. Um, and that was not seen in the robotic-assisted uh, TKA cohort. In terms of um, post-op pain, everything was converted to morphine milligram equivalents to better objective, objectively um, assess this data. Um, so the manual TKA group um, had a higher opioid consumption at 89.9 mme, while the um, robotic-assisted group had opioid consumption at 65.2 mme, and the p-value was equal to 0 0.02, which did reach, reach significance. So our next um, case study that we looked at was OFA et al. Is this, a, this was a retrospective cohort design used to compare patients who underwent a robotic-assisted TKA and manual TKA between the years of 2010 and the second quarter of 2017. Um, basic demographic information, clinical characteristics, instance, incidences of perioperative and postoperative sy uh, systemic and joint complications and, and pain management load questions were kind of asked uh, and assessed in this um, article. Again, the MMEs, the morphine milligram equivalents, were calculated to help um, better objectify um, this, this assessment. Uh, there was a total of seven, 755,350 primary TKAs in this group with the MTKA group having um, 750,122 versus the robotic assisted group having 5,228 participants. So getting down into the details of this, um, the MTKA cohort had significantly higher risks of revision at one year after discharge compared to those in the robotic-assisted cohort. Um, during the inpatient stay, the, man, the MTKA cohort had a higher occurrence of DVTs, altered mental status, PEs, anemia, uh, cerebral vascular events, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. Um, and it, that was something very, very significant for uh, this study. Um, <clears throat> in 90 days after discharge on their post-op follow-ups, um, there is still significant higher rates of DVT, altered mental status, some PEs, anemia, um, some um, anemia, like anemias and um, 
respiratory failures as well um, in the manual TKA cohort. The cohort also uh, displayed higher incidences of um, MMEs as well at 1,150, while the robotic assisted TKAs had an MME of 873. This was also consistent for the six month and year follow up uh, in these patients. So this is going along the terms of our previous study in terms of the uh, MME equivalents. So going to our next study, Mancino et al. Um, this was a represented data from nine total studies, three of them being randomized control, another three being perspective comparative studies, and uh, finally the last three being retrospective comparative studies. There's a total of 1,199 TKs performed on 1,159 patients with the manual TKA group being 551 patients um, and the robotic assisted TKA being cohort being uh, 608 patients. So operating time was reported um, in four of the nine studies. Three of them reported the mean surgical time of 88 minutes in the robotic assisted uh, TKA cohort versus 79 minutes in the manual TKA cohort. So it was taking a little bit longer for the our robotic assisted TKA cohort to, to complete the surgery. Uh, revision rates were reported in four of the studies as well, and um, the robotic assisted TKA group's overall revision rate was reported at 1.79 versus the, the manual TKA cohort reporting a revision rate of 2.7. So that is something that is significant for, for patients to kind of consider um, when de determining if they want to do a robotic assisted or a manual TKA. Um, six studies reported complications that re required uh, reoperation. 2.4% were actually in the robotic assisted TKA and 1.4% in the, in the manual TKA. So there's a higher um, risk of uh, reoperation due to complications in the robotic assisted uh, cohort. So Hamilton et al. conducted a small uh, scale study of 166 patients at a urban tertiary care center between January and July uh, 2019 with each group having 83 participants. Um, everything was pretty much the same, the same uh, surgeon using the same approach, implant and robot, uh, things like that, so it was pretty consistent throughout the board. Um, the primary, primary interest uh, in this study was the average differences in pain scores after surgery between the two cohorts. Uh, and this was measured on 0, 1, and 2 days post-op, 0 being once they got out of the operating room. Um, <clears throat> for patients, for all patients, overall mean 3-day score was 5.52, which was not a significant difference in pain scores. Um, really, the only difference was um, coming on post-op day 0 in the robotic-assisted TKA group, which is experiencing higher pain compared to that of the, the uh, manual TKA group. Um, interestingly enough though, the post-operative post pain medication trend kind of went towards patients of the MTKA group requiring higher doses of morphine on post-op day two. So Merchand et al. did a data, coll data collected by one orthopedic surgeon um, at a high volume institute between July 1st and August 15th of 2016. There was 20 consecutive MTKAs and then 20 consecutive robotic assisted TKAs, um, both cohorts following the same re rehabilitation protocols. And I included what the uh, article was kind of assessing, but I will uh, further be talking about that in the results of the, the uh, research on the, the next slide. So looking at pain scores for Merchant et al. and the uh, participants in this study, mean score for the manual TK cohort was 5 with a standard deviation of plus or minus 3 on a range of 0 to 10. Um, and for the robotic assisted cohort, it was 3 with a plus or minus 3 in a range of, of 0 to 8. This kind of signifying that the robotic assisted TKA cohort had um, overall better mobility and function. 
Um, then physical function scores, again, mean score for the MTKA cohort was found to be 9 plus or minus 5 on a range of 0 to 17, and um, RK, RA TKA group was 4 with plus or minus 5 on a range of 0 to 14, meaning that the robotic-assisted uh, TKA cohort had better function, um, even though it was half of, or nearly half, of um, the, the manual TKA cohort, no statistical significance was found between uh, the two scores. For satisfaction scores, um, MTKA uh, was 14 plus or minus 8 on a range of 0 to 27, and RTKA um, group was 7 plus or minus 8 on a range of 0 to 22. This uh, was the RTK, RATK group uh, had a significantly lower um, mean total patient satisfaction score, uh, indicating greater, greater patient satisfaction and clinical outcome for the robotic assisted TKA cohort. So, Naziri et al., um, he did a retrospective review of prospect, retrospective review of prospectively. Um, collected data on patients who underwent a TKA by a single fellowship trained surgeon. So 40 adults older than 18 years of age who agreed to comply with the post-op requirements uh, were matched one by one um, to age, gender, BMI, comorbidity, comorbidities, preoperative range of motion with the other 40 patients. So it was a pretty good, well-based, fair um, study uh, in that terms. So the same preoperative protocols as well, um, same anesthesia, um, all that good stuff. And then this is really assessing for length of stay, range of motion pre and post operatively, intraoperative estimated blood loss, surgical time, um, and patient satisfaction rates as well. So getting down to the details of Naziria at all. Um, the MTK cohort and uh, robotic assisted TK cohort had similar preoperative range of motions, um, and then it, length of stay did reach significance uh, with 0 0.001 p-value. Um, the length of stay was being a little longer for the manual TKA, TKA uh, cohort versus the robotic assisted TKA cohort. Um, Intraoperative blood loss was was pretty similar as well. No significance was not reached there. Um, reduced surgical time um, did reach significance, favoring the manual uh, TKA cohort, just as the the previous study kind of exhibited as well. Um, interestingly enough, 90-day post-op range of motion um, did not improve um, in the compared to preoperative scores for a manual TKA cohort. TKA cohort where it did improve for the robotic-assisted TKO cohort. Um, comparable data between um, the two was there's really no significance, um, significant differences in complication rates. The patient-reported outcomes were, um, for measures for lower extremity, were pretty comparable as well. And then the hospital um, satisfaction survey didn't show any differences. So looking at the results collectively in, in a more holistic scope, um, there was immense promise to in improving TK outcomes when using the, the MAKO system. Um, the ability to reduce the length of stay was shown, uh, lower rates of readmission rates for low, lower rates of readmission for revision, fewer opioid requirements postoperatively, and um, greater patient satisfaction were all displayed pretty much throughout the, the um, articles obtained. And that can be very, very significant for uh, patients who are choosing uh, to go one way or the other. Not quite statistically significant, but still important to note. Um, the differences in major or minor complications at 30, 60, and 90 days following um, on a follow-up appointment. Um, some of the articles did show didn't reach significance, but there were um, some notable um, things in there. The advantages for 
um, robotic assisted TKA to be discharged home rather than a subacute uh, rehabilitation centers looking at like the PT visits things like that that uh, we talked about before um, didn't quite reach significance but it is still important to, to kind of note for patients um, improved preservation of soft tissue surrounding the operative area that can also be contributed to fewer opioid requirements post-operatively um, limiting that, that damage and inflammation and overall pain for patients um, the one area of concern that was kind of noted uh, throughout my research was the increased surgical time for robotic assisted TKAs. There were multiple studies that we discussed that um, showed that the robotic assisted TKA cohort did require a little bit more time um, in surgery, increasing the chance of, of possible complications. So the limitations for um, my current research was the the MAKO system was the only FDA-approved robotic platform at the time, um, basically just assuming that all studies use the MAKO system, even if it did not specify that uh, in the article. There is a widespread of, of differences in studies, uh, in the study design, study participants, in the time frame of studies, um, potentially introducing some, some bias regarding perceived superiority of the robotic uh, technique. Maybe some patients were aware of that, aware of the fact that they were going in with uh, robotic assisted TKA, thinking that this is uh, up and coming, this is supposed to help me recover, decrease my pain, and therefore creating that bias. Um, some some uh, research articles did use um, some different types of coding and um, software so potential coding bias was also in effect um, again affecting the reported values between cohorts and then incomplete pre and post operative uh, proms it was a was a big thing as well uh, patients were relied on heavily to report their prom data and if this wasn't correlated over post operatively then it was it was tough to kind of compare and uh, we are just not aware of that, or I just was not aware of that um, and unable to get that information throughout the, the research process. Um, there were some smaller studies done, uh, conducted at a single institute by the same surgeon, um, and that may have helped limited some so co-founding co factors. Um, maybe another surgeon does something a little bit different or uses a different type of antibiotic that can also create some bias in this um, research. So looking forward to the future research and what needs done, uh, some correlating studies are an area of interest. Data was collected at 30, 60, and 90 days post-operatively, um, looking more so at the short-term outcomes rather than the long-term. So getting information of maybe one, two, three, ten years down the road would be very beneficial for some of these patients to kind of determine how their life will will be five, ten years down or out of surgery. Cost effectiveness, um, there is an association of robotic assisted might be a little bit more expensive due to technology, um, but cost benefits of being discharged home versus rehabilitation center should be looked at as well. Um, obviously, some studies showed that the PT length was a little bit longer in the manual TKA group compared to the robotic assisted TKA group. So that is definitely something that it piques interest for, for patients, which one might be cheaper. So in summary, the use of the robotic uh, arm using the use of the Mako robotic arm interactive system has shown great potential in reducing the length of stay and readmission rates, lowering the opioid requirements and increasing patient satisfaction in the percentage of patients being discharged home rather than um, an acute or subacute rehabilitation center. Um, these factors can lead to lower complication rates and improved post-surgical results. <clears throat> and Neosar arthritis, in conclusion, is a multifactorial disease, and once it starts, there's little to nothing that a patient can do to stop the progression. Um, from little symptoms to debilitating constant pain, um, the presentation is wide in variety. Uh, once the patient are no longer able to get relief from the conservative treatments, um, 
surgical options should be in discussion. Technological advancements um, are are our treatment options, making our treatment options kind of broad. Um, and one promising technological advancement is the MAKO system as this study kind of demonstrated. Um, <clears throat> the use of the MAKO system yields promising post-operative outcomes with lower complication rates, um, wind factors such as short, shorter length of stay, lower readmission rates, um, increased pain, um, patient, increased patient satisfaction, sorry, um, and lower use of opioids and high rates of patients being discharged home rather than the uh, subacute um, rehabilitation center kind of correlate, um, they kind of correlate over to the lower systemic complications. Um, therefore, it's important uh, for a total joint surgeon to kind of consider implementing the use of the, the MAKO system into the uh, procedure and it's also important for the patients to kind of consider um, that as well. So this is my um, the conclusion of my presentation. If you have any questions please reach out to me at the email below.